You're listening to XVGM Radio. Welcome to XVGM Radio, where the bits keep coming. I'm Justin. And I'm Mike. And this is episode 72, Vanillaware Games with special guest Pragmatic. Hello I'm there. excited for this one. <laughs> we have a great topic that not many people are covering these days. You know, it's still a relatively new company. We've done company episodes before. We did like Toa Plan. We did like a Namco chip specialty episode. We've done a couple others here and there, but development companies are always fun to talk about because you get an in-depth look at their games. Mm -hmm. uh, you get an in-depth look at the music and uh, we've got some really interesting topics to, to tackle. And Pragmatic, aka Joey, is a great person to have on for this episode because he is a Vanillaware super fan. So Joey, thanks so much for joining us on the episode. Tell us a little bit about your channel. Well, my name is Pragmatic on YouTube. I try to do reviews of games that most people may not have heard of or just certain games that I like and don't get enough credit and Vanillaware is one big staple about that. I think I've covered nearly almost every Vanillaware game that's like released in the US at least <laughs> and from there I just usually do side things on the channel but mostly it's just reviews I found out about your channel probably about uh, two years ago I want to say maybe longer two or three. and I saw uh, some of your early reviews and I found them hysterical Joey does skits kind of like my channel on dude you haven't played this game <laughs> but his skits are funny just, <laughs> like, oh, yeah <laughs> no seriously like, no, I like like I too Mike <laughs> I fully, fully admit my jokes are not funny. Or at least I don't try. Like, I try to be funny, but at the same time, I'm like, hey, this isn't funny, right? But Joey's stuff is legit, like, hilarious. Like, I almost every single video that he puts out where he's reviewing a game, I will definitely laugh out loud at some of his stuff because his wit and, and his delivery is really what sells it for me. So well, That's always uh, reassuring to hear. Yeah, Because I'm absolutely. always never too confident in my own skits, but uh, that always gives me some <laughs> confidence <laughs> absolutely yeah everyone go check out his channel links down below if you like video game reviews and you want some humor kind of mixed in there uh without it being obnoxious like mine go go check out his uh his channel 
to, uh, to be fair, I, I assume that you uh, that, that you approach writing jokes for your channel the, way, the same way that we approach writing commercials and call-ins for this show. <laughs> like, yeah, anything that makes me laugh out loud hysterically. There's definitely some moments where like I'll write something and it'll be like, oh, this is so bad. I can't put this in. And then I'll be like, yo, that's why it's funny. So I got to put it in. So <laughs> that's, exactly. That's exactly the reason. If you're like, well, I think it's funny, then that's all that matters. Exactly. <laughs> So, but we are here today to talk about Vanillaware, and we opened up the episode with Pragmatic's intro pick, which is from Odin Sphere. Uh, This came out on the PlayStation 2 in 2007 and the PS3 in 2011, Uh, and uh, that's uh, The Mysterious Hookah Village is the name of the track, and it's by Hitoshi Sakimoto, Masaharu Iwata, Kimihiro Abe, Mitsuhiro Kaneda, and Manabu Namiki. And we'll talk about those composers throughout this episode because uh, pretty sure that we're going to be covering a lot of their stuff, and you'll learn <laughs> uh, a bit about why that is very soon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what do you think of this one, uh, Justin? I like it a lot. I, I know we've we've heard some some stuff by these people before. Hitoshi Sakamoto is no stranger to this show, but I o- always kind of assume that I'm going to be getting like an orchestral vibe from, from from this stuff. And this was very orchestral. And I, I don't I don't know how to explain how it feels like it's more orchestral than other orchestral stuff that we, we've played. But I also yeah. just want to see how many times I can say orchestral on this show before somebody gets mad. Um, Ooh. <laughs> So the, I, I would say the, the slowdown the, the, right before like the loop, because they, they, they did it twice, like that slowdown was really, really nice. Um, I don't see that often in a lot of video game music, like maybe here and there. Uh, and obviously this is a like a, a theme for like a village, I'm assuming by the name of Puka. It, it's just really cool to have this thing that literally takes the momentum of the piece and slows it down. It's just like, wait a second, pay, pay attention right here, because this music... <laughs> is doing fun things and i just like i got such a full a full feeling uh for you got because you could hear like the winds the strings mm. the horns and then obviously like some synths so it, it got a little bit hard for me to determine like what's synth and what's real instruments because it felt like both at different times i got you i got you yeah i got a bit of a like latin samba kind of vibe mm. at point and the the more i think about it the mysterious puka village you know i'm thinking like puka shell necklace i'm thinking mm. like beachfront area maybe like caribbean a little bit mm. so i gotta ask joey is this a track that takes place down by like a beach type area do you know oh no far from it this is actually played at the puka village which is um kind of like a hub part to increase your stats and like you just go to the puka village and talk to the fellow pukas and try their cuisines and it's kind of like a breakaway from all the fighting and the story it's just a place you can go to if you want but it's take it takes place in a city setting so it's like a city oh. kind of like illuminated at night okay so no, it's, it's not, not beach a beach setting. <laughs> no. no no okay then but well I, color me wrong <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Well, what do you think about the the track, Joey? Well, I, I always really like it because it feels like such a calm down uh, mm-hmm. after the fights and stuff. It's such a jovial and peaceful track. And the, kind of the more you learn about the Puka in general, the more you think they wouldn't have a theme like this. Mm. But uh, I love how it just blends so many types of instruments and sounds to make it sound so happy. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So we're going to be talking about Odin Sphere quite a bit through this episode but i figure we'll uh, we'll jump into our next pick which is again another pick by pragmatic mm-hmm. so uh joey what's your uh, what's your first pick okay this one's actually a little hard to say but i believe i believe it's isoleucine which is a battle theme from their newest game 13 sentinels aegis rim and the composers on that on the <laughs> ps4 2020 release is hitoshi sakamoto Mitsuhiro Kaneda, Yoshimi Kudo, Rikako Watanabe, and Yukinori Kikuchi. Thank you. 
Welcome back. That was Isoleucine from 13 Sentinels, Aegis Rim, the 2020 release on the PS4, composed by Hitoshi Sakamoto, Mitsuhiro Kaneda, Yoshimi Kudo, Rikako Watanabe, and Yukinori Kikuchi. Yeah, there's some other composers that are listed on various different sources f- for this game. Mm-hmm. Uh, like Wikipedia has a couple more on top of that, but I think they're like sound production, uh, not necessarily composers. But this mm-hmm. track, man, totally oh. a Hitoshi Sakamoto jam. <laughs> like 100%. I mean, that cr- like creaky electronic bass more towards the beginning mm-hmm. and uh, at, and like later on in the track too. It's just, like... For me, at least personally, the most memorable. I, I really love the mix of the electronic elements with the more like orchestral parts. Yeah, um, yeah. It was really cool. Like uh, I, this track surprised me quite a bit and it just, it transforms so much. And then at the end, right, I, I think, and Joey will have to correct us if, uh, if we're wrong here, but I think that is right at the end of the track, there's like a little fanfare that's like, you did it. <laughs> sort of thing for a battle and then uh it goes into another part that's like uh here's all the stuff that you got from the battle that sort of sound. yeah that is kind of what it feels like is that yeah, accurate you, ab- you absolutely nailed it um Boom. that was that was it kind of theming the own song into its own victory theme and then showing you the result screen that's pretty cool that's fantastic oh, that's yeah. really interesting because like again something that you don't really see often like you look at final fantasy or any any like grpg the victory theme is set like the bat the victory theme is separate from the battle theme and i mean you got like final fantasy 7 the victory theme rolls right into like the items screen theme but it's also very like there's not really a whole lot going on there um Mm -hmm. and this just did it all in one and it felt cohesive like i was i was a little bit startled when uh when that victory theme came in but like it it it, it, only enough to like wake me up and say hey hey something's going on here and then like the way that it flowed just like it still felt like the same song which is just very unique Joey, what do you think of this one? Oh, yeah, it's definitely one of my favorites. And you have to think that that is quite the long track for a battle that lasts about two to three minutes. So there's some real dedication to this track. And like you said before, just the synth kind of merging into a string composition really just kind of keeps you engaged like while you're in the battle and it's like almost kind of a shame that you can't hear it over the uh all the dialogue and everything but you can just kind of hear it faintly that just keeps you with the fight the entire time hopefully it's not one of those situations like a lot of triple a modern games where they put the music really really quiet but it's there (laughs) <laughs> and there's no option to change the music volumes. Like I would much rather hear loud music in the background th- and and actually be able to hear it than you know hear the dialogue and hear the sound effects and all that stuff. Like to me, music you should have a slider for the music and the music music should be able to be bumped way up. All the voice lines are kind of spoken through radio communicators, so it kind of blends in with the song. It just kind of goes along with it. It definitely mm. doesn't hmm. like feel like it's kind of contrasting too much did anybody else hear smash brothers melee's music (laughs) i think it's like almost like the same uh string like it's so close that 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 like it was kind of like (laughs) tweaked so that it wasn't exactly that but like when i heard it it definitely made me spring up and go whoa wait a minute was that smash brothers like it was really funny (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah no for sure i would say yeah. uh so the the entire track was really awesome i i was really into like the the electronic pop stuff that they had going on um but towards the middle ish or like the the end middle the it got like really dark electronic it, it felt almost like kind of like electronic body move uh, music and it just mm. it, it was kind of it, not so different from the rest of the song that it felt like it didn't go like it felt like it went but like the transition was just really nice and i i really enjoyed like that that little segment um it was just mm-hmm. it, like, right in my wheelhouse of, of stuff that i enjoy listening to for fun yeah this really takes me back to sakimoto's genesis era mm-hmm. uh, especially with that that bass line that crunchy bass it, it really reminded me of games like veritex and devilish gauntlet for like the, the that genesis era where he was arranging music. Joey, can you tell us a little bit about this 13 Sentinels game? I know it's kind of new, and I I believe if I recall you, you did a, not a review, but you did like a, um, like a spotlight 
like first impression sort of thing. So can yeah, you tell us about it, it? Yes, it was definitely a first impression because I didn't feel like I had totally played enough to consider it a review, but it was definitely me wanting to highlight that this game needs to be played by whoever finds it interesting because hmm. it's just such a good game. It was absolutely my game of the year last year and you have to think that that's kind of going up against like the final fantasy 7 remake sure oh wow that, mm -hmm. yeah it was just that good to me um hmm. i think it's about a 40 40 hour game i think it released in 2019 in japan and we were supposed to get it close behind but i think with all the issues going around like around with uh just in japan and just with the world in general it did get delayed especially mm -hmm. when it came to getting the english voice acting but what i heard was that they had all set in to do it from home and eventually it all got put together and it sounded great mm -hmm. this game is their latest game and i would almost strongly can say it would it's probably one of their best <laughs> Like right up there with Odin Sphere. That's high praise. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, what kind of a game is it? Like, tell us about the uh, the gameplay and and tell us a little bit about the you know the overall plot and schematics of the game. It is kind of a um, a visual novel blended together with a tower defense game where there are thirteen sentinels piloted by children from various timelines, and you jump from one timeline to the next to see how they all all their stories intertwine and how mm. they end up choosing to pilot one of these sentinels that so they can stop this incoming invasion and you're just slowly figuring out the story of each character and what this invasion is and like each character in each chapter just has you just guessing at what happens next hmm. and it's got a unique setup where you can either choose to fight or do each battle successfully or successively and or just choose a character's story to see their chapters and it's one or the other you can do anyone whenever you want eventually it does kind of lock battles back and like it'll want you to view more characters stories or it'll lock stories behind and want you to do more battles but <laughs> at any time you can choose to do either one and both sides of that game are very interesting and pretty engaging i will say the combat aspect of the game is a little less interesting than the story but i think they blend together so well that it doesn't really matter yeah it looks like settings wise it takes place between a bunch of different time periods uh, 1985, 1945, 2025, 2065, 2105. It's just like it's jumping all over past and future and present time periods, so to speak. So, oh, yeah, um, yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, uh, that is a major plot point of just jumping between the timelines that I can't get super into without spoiling things. But sure, sure. It, it does make sense. Very cool. We are going to continue talking about the composers that are featured here, but we wanted to touch on the exclusive composers. Yeah, so one of them is Rikako Watanabe. The two audio credits here are this game, 13 Sentinels, uh, and Dragon's Crown Pro, which we'll be talking about later. Uh, and then uh, the other person is Yukinori Kikuchi, who has a few more things, starting out in 1996 with doing sound and music design on Tetris S, uh, went on to do music in Dangan in 2000, as well as Pro Gear in 2001. Uh, and then this game here, uh, 13 Sentinels. Yeah, there was a soundtrack that was released back in February of last year, which you can get, I believe, on Atlas's online shop. Uh, it's four discs, and it has cover art by the featured artist Harai. So pretty cool. Good stuff. Yeah, and it, getting there. Yeah, for sure. If, if the rest of the music is uh, anywhere near... <laughs> on this level it's definitely worth picking up oh i can guarantee you at the very least that they are the whole soundtrack is worth listening to nice justin what do you got coming up for us in this episode all right so next we are going to hear from a little known game called kumatanchi this came out on the nintendo ds back in 2008 this is J japan exclusive so if you haven't heard about it it's because it did not come out here in america uh, mm -hmm. The track is just simply titled BGM05, and it was composed by Kimihiro Abe and Mitsuhiro Kaneda.
Hey there, uh, welcome back to our Vanillaware Spotlight. That was Kubatanchi, and that came out on the Nintendo DS in 2008. The track was BGM05, composed by Kimihiro Abe and Mitsuhiro Kaneda. I got one word for you, mm -hmm. Justin. Aww. <laughs> I don't know if that's actually a word, but I'll that, take it. Uh... That that was very adorable. It was a, a I, I pictured like a sunny school day with a bunch of little kids learning. I don't know how to make. I don't know chicken nuggets. I don't know. Gross. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you know how chicken nuggets are made, it's gross. Um, I would have just said like paper cranes or something. Yeah, yeah. Cute. You know, I mean, just something fun. Like you yeah. know, maybe just eating chicken nuggets. I don't know. Uh, that's fair. Uh, it, it, children eating chicken nuggets is probably about the aesthetic of this game. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't mean for that to sound as bad as it might have. Um, the game is cute. It, so this this game stands out to me uh, because at first when I saw it, I was like, wow, oh, really? This is a Vanillaware game? And then after after looking at uh, a, a few bits bits and pieces of it and some other games that I wasn't as familiar with I I could start to see the uh the, the similarities but man this is it's it's just such a cute little life sim game like it's it, it's all all it really is it's very simple mm -hmm. um it it's set in a zoo uh housing uh, so all all of the animals are like moe anthropomorphic uh young girls Mm -hmm. So the more I talk about it, the weirder it sounds. But I promise you, yeah. it's not weird. It's just cute. <laughs> it's very, very innocent. But definitely still invested. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> the, uh, the, as, as the player, you are the caretaker of the zoo and you're looking after you know, a new uh, arrival, a, a bear girl named Kumatan. Like I said, it, it's a life sim type game, so they, they have all, all the the characters have like stats, like mood, and maybe things like um, uh, hunger and stuff like that. So you have to like take care of them and whatnot. It so they have a chicken night and chicken nugget chi life bar. Right, right. Ch chicken nugget right. meter, chicken nuggetometer. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I mean, overall, this game looks to be as adorable as this track was. Very cool. Uh, the visual style in this is a little different than most games that Vanillaware has worked on. And that's partially because uh, it was co-developed by a uh, doujin studio called mm. Ashinaga Oji-san. Oji yep. So they did the visual style a little differently than uh, what you may be used to when you see a Vanillaware title, but uh, we should probably get into that. Let's talk a little bit about Vanillaware and then we'll get back mm. into uh, the game, its composers, etc. Vanillaware was founded in 2002 and they're based out of Osaka, though they like had to move eventually to Osaka, but they were like sort of based out of there initially. Their original name for the company was Puraguru. Hmm, interesting. Their founder was a man by the name of George Kamitani, and he is an industry veteran who were actually worked with Capcom. They were widely praised and celebrated for their high detail 2.5D and highly detailed hand-drawn graphics, which is usually shown throughout their entire mm. catalog of games. <laughs> you know, Vanilla, Vanillaware has their own style that has been improved upon and cultivated within the company, and you see a Vanillaware game, you know who made it. Mm. Absolutely. Their first game was Princess Crown, and that that was their, their first title before they were actually named Vanillaware officially. It actually sold so poorly that the publisher Atlas Kansai was forced to shut down, and the development team was supposedly blacklisted uh, with the sequel of the game, uh, which was planned for the Dreamcast, being canned. Oh, wow. And then uh, Base Escape, which is the audio company founded by veteran VGM composer Hitoshi Sakamoto, handles sound and music for pretty much all the Vanillaware titles. Yeah, they do work for other companies as well. That's why this wasn't a Base Escape themed episode. It's more our focus is more on Vanillaware as a company as a whole. Uh, it just so happens that Base Escape is the company that does the music for for all their games. I I, I know that we've talked about Base Escape before. Yeah, they've they've done a bunch of work for various different companies. Uh, they did Soul Calibur Legends. Uh, they did Trauma Center Under the Knife Two, uh, oh. Death Smiles. Soul Calibur Legends is I I knew it came from the Soul Calibur episode. It's uh, the Soul Calibur yes. Legends uh, track that we played. Yep. 
Yes, 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 yeah. So, yeah, they have a pretty extensive list of stuff that they've been working on since uh, 2002. So <laughs> definitely a cool company. Well, I'm sure at some point in time we'll get to them, like, independently of uh, Vanillaware. Oh, yeah. So yeah. I guess we can talk about uh, our composers. Yeah, Kimihiro Abe. This is another name that you'll hear uh, many times throughout the, the, sh- the, the episode. But since this game only has two composers, we'll hit them now. But Kimihiro uh, Abe started out doing, in 2006, Russian Songs Arranger on Sega Ages 2500, Volume 28, Tetris Collection. <laughs> Uh, he went on yes. to do a lot of other music composition. Digimon World Data Squad in 2006, uh, Upuna in 2007, Final Fantasy Tactics A2, Grimoire of the Rift in 2007 as well. Um, most recently, that they, they have a credit in 2012 for Crimson Shroud. And that was, I think, four years after Kumantachi. Yeah, yeah that's labeled as another base escape game. Yep. Yep. And then Mitsuhiro Kaneda started out doing sound data programming in Fantavision in 2000. Wow, that's a game I hadn't thought about in forever. Wound up doing music composition in es- uh, Espgaluda 2 in 2005, and then went on to do so, so much. Uh, in 2006, Battle B. Daman Fire Spirits. Uh, in 2007, he arranged on Final Fantasy 12 Revenant Wings. In 2009, he did music arrangement on Crystal Defenders R2, and most recently, uh, he's listed for music composition on 13 Sentinels, which we just talked about. All right, let's get into the next game. And uh, this is one that uh, all three of us, I think, uh, are somewhat familiar with, (laughs) and you might be as well. This is Dragon's Crown Pro. This came out on the PlayStation 3 in 2013, and it later was released for the PlayStation 4 in 2018. And I believe it might have also had a Vita release. Uh, mm-hmm. Yes, it did. Uh, 2013 as well. Mm-hmm. So good to know. Uh, the track is called A Decision Has to Be Made. Welcome back to XVGM Radio with Pragmatic, a.k.a. Joey. We are talking about (laughs) Vanillaware games on this episode, and we just listened to Dragon's Crown Pro. This came out on the PlayStation 3 in 2013, as well as the PlayStation Vita. It came out on the PlayStation 4 in 2018. This track was called A Decision Has to Be Made, and it certainly sounds like that's the case. (laughs) The composer on this one is just Hitoshi Sakimoto, so we'll dive strictly into him in just a little bit. What uh, do you think of this track, Joey? Oh, it's very intense, and I can't really, like, 
pinpoint where it takes place in the game, I kind of want to say maybe towards the end. It's very intense, and it kind of definitely keeps that entire theme throughout the entire game. Agreed. What about you, Justin? Funny, that, that's pretty much exactly what I wrote word for word, so... No, <laughs> no I, I, I... I was reading your script. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I... The first thing that I wrote down was just intense. Like, this this track is, is so intense. So, like, as soon as you said that, you said that, I was like, yeah, no, it's, it's not just me, at least. <laughs> Overall, like, I got a lot of different things out of this, but I, I, I'm not sure how much I got out of it because I know the game it's from um or or because i was looking at the box art from the game or whatnot there there's a lot in here that that kind of says like D D boss fight to me a, a few other things but what i what i pulled out that i thought was kind of interesting is those um those synth horns that the, that, uh, that he has in there like especially again towards the end give me real like warcraft 2 vibes and um and that that's that's a game that i enjoy a whole lot uh, and it's just really funny because I hadn't thought about it until it just came in my head from the way that those horns do their thing almost if you go back to whatever episode I was silly enough to play I'm a medieval man on uh, from oh, the, the hidden that was Warcraft our episode. Our, that, I think that was our last prefix episode that's right yep yeah so if, if you go to that like there, there's some some horn sections in that that sound kind of similar and just make me laugh <laughs> Yeah, this is definitely a very strong, very intense track for sure. You took the word, both of you took the words right out of my mouth. So you uh, you definitely nailed the vibe on this one. It does seem like a final battle or at least maybe like leading up to a final battle. So that that's a possibility. I don't remember where this plays in the game as well. Uh, I also haven't finished the game. I got this when it was re-released on the PS4. And one of the cool things about this game is that the Dragon's Crown Pro is cross-platform with the PS3 version, mm -hmm. uh, Dragon's Crown. So yeah, there's some differences in the actual game itself. I believe like the music has been remastered where it's like a lot more orchestral for this version of the soundtrack, I believe. There's some other things that were changed for the game, but for the most part, it is the same type of game. It's a beat em up where you get six different character classes that you can pick. You mentioned Dungeons and Dragons. It's pretty much inspired by Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, this was actually that sequel that we were talking about that got canned for the Dreamcast. So this right. was actually originally supposed to release for the Dreamcast as a sequel to Princess Crown, but they completely gutted and restarted everything from scratch and decided to, to come out with, with this game. It is exclusive to Sony's consoles. The game got a lot of heat for the exaggerated physical status of the female characters in particular, the sorceress and the warrior. The barbarian, female. I believe. Yeah, the, is it the barbarian? Yeah, the female the barbarian. Fair the fair barbarian. <laughs> fair barbarian. The bear barbarian. Uh, the Fibarian. Fibarian. <laughs> so, yeah, they're uh, very, like, exaggerated physical attributes to the characters, you know, in, in large chesticles and, you know, massive muscles. And, you know, all the characters have that. Like, it's it's not just... Well, actually, that's not true. The There's, a, like, an archer-type character, and she's she's not as exaggerated. But, yeah, those, those two female characters, as well as the male, like, dwarf-type character, I guess you could call him. They all are like super muscular and wildly proportioned. And so the game got a lot of heat for that. If you actually sit down and play the game, it's very fun. It's it's a little confusing at first. Joey can back me up on this because he and I tried to play online together in this, but we found out that we weren't able to. I think it was you, me, and a couple of our other YouTube friends. We all were like, oh, we'll, we'll play Dragon's Crown Pro online when it comes out. So we tried to play it, and uh, then we realized, oh, wait, we can't do multiplayer until you unlock the stables, like the horse stables, mm. and then multiplayer unlocks so you can play online with people. So we were all separately playing single player games, trying to unlock this <laughs> at the same time. And it just didn't work out. Do you remember that? Oh yeah. And honestly, I think the saddest part is like, we all just never got around to it because you know, unlocking one part is something, but I think that takes about four hours of gameplay to Ooh. actually unlock. 
Yeah, it takes a while to unlock those stables, and I know I finally did, and I was like, great, I unlocked the stables, guys, and everybody else was like, moved on to other stuff, and I was like, but wait, what about Dragon's Crown? So I, I will have to go back and like restart the game just to like get back into it, but I recently bought Justin a copy <laughs> of just gonna the say. PS3 version yep. for uh, our winter episode. Uh, we did a little unboxing for gifts that we got each other. Well, the three of us should sit down and play some uh, some Dragon's Crown. I'm down here. Yeah. I just got to get to that stable. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give you four hours of a uh, jump start. So. Yeah, right. So Hitoshi Sakamoto, no stranger to this podcast. We talk about him quite a bit. He started off working on audio work with Starship Rendezvous in 1988. Uh, he later did Bubble Ghost in 1990, Veritex in 1991. He did the arrangement on Midnight Resistance for the Sega Genesis. He also did Devilish, The Next Position, which was on the Genesis as well. He did a lot of Genesis arrangement for the Sega Genesis. Captain America and the Avengers was another one where he ported the game over to the Genesis with the sound. Uh, he did original music for Gauntlet 4. Nice. Go check that out. That's it. That's uh, Hitoshi Sakimoto in a nutshell. Really amazing composer. Definitely his Genesis stuff, at least in my opinion, is my favorite of his mm, of his work. Looks like Joey, you're going to be bringing us back to uh, Odin Sphere. What are we What are we going to play up next? I believe the next one is called Battle in the Labyrinth Two, which comes from the land of Titania in the game Odin Sphere. All right. So Odin Sphere came out on the PS2 in 2007, and in 2011 came out on the PS3, and this was another base escape game. Let's hit it.
welcome back. That was Odin Sphere, the PlayStation 2 game that came out in 2007. Came out on PlayStation 3 in 2011. I believe it also got a, a PS4 port as well. The track is Battle in the Labyrinth 2, and it's by Hitoshi Sakimoto, Masaharu Iwata, Kimihiro Abe, Mitsuhiro Kaneda, and Manabu Namiki. Dang. This one was kind of like weird i like it almost had like a calming vibe but there was like something sinister lurking underneath um so like it was kind of like a laid back isn't the right word but it, it was a low-key track uh that i that i really enjoyed uh, and if i had to give it an award i would probably give it best use of a woodblock <laughs> for sure i i yes. really enjoyed like they they had mo- different types of wood blocks you like you could hear like the the one that's like ridged and and it makes it like noise and then like just that's actually a wood block playing another wood block it technically is yeah <laughs> you're not technically wrong <laughs> yes the ps4 version of this game was called odin sphere lift thrasher or left thra 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 thrasier thrasier yeah that's something here, German lip thrasier yeah and that got released in 2016 oh, okay yeah but yeah no this track was very calming but I do get like a sinister vibe from it very cutscene oriented or cuts I get like a cutscene vibe from it hmm. So maybe I'm correct, maybe I'm wrong. I guess I, Joey would have to tell us. I, I get more of a like lurking around, like looking looking for something. Like you're in a, like a dungeon of some sort, and and you're trying okay. to like put stuff together. But Joey, mm. uh, tell us the truth. <laughs> I would say you're both very close. This mm. um takes place while you're walking around the city of Titania, mm. and you're very close because this is a town that is prosperous but there's a lot of going is on about throughout the town that you find out about with people mm. plotting against the kingdom and just all kinds of different things and despite it being called battle in the labyrinth 2 you're not actually fighting this kind of plays <laughs> in between fights where mm. you can get into minor fights but they're not the major orchestral fights you're used to and oh, i really weird. find myself getting drawn to the uh the softer pieces in this game because they're just more spread out and uh just really unique and this one in particular really makes good use of all kinds of instruments and they're not just uh, set in a pattern they're all just kind of done sporadically throughout the entire track but yeah you're both very close to (laughs) the theming of that song that's funny this this really reminds me of an uimatsu track too like i could totally picture this being in a final fantasy game like maybe final fantasy 8 or something like that where it, it, it just has that really clean, almost like you can't tell if it's MIDI or if it's real instruments sort of thing. It's it's pretty cool. Mm. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like it's definitely got that middle part where just a random acoustic guitar just starts like softly strumming throughout it. Yeah, that kind of <laughs> came out of nowhere. <laughs> Reminds me of uh, a couple of tracks in like Final Fantasy IX where uh, it's like random Spanish guitar. <laughs> Yeah. So tell us a little bit about uh, Odin Sphere. I'm, uh, I've, I've got very little knowledge of it, and uh, I'll tell, I'll, I'll talk about my personal experience with the game and the gripes that I had with it during the, uh, the next break that we talk about Odin Sphere. Well, I'd like to hear about that. I mean, this is how it all started for me. <laughs> but the plot of Odin Sphere is basically five characters getting intertwined with one central story and a prophecy that they all learn about that the world is going to end and they're kind of in their own way preventing that whether they know it or not Hmm. and it takes place between five central characters Gwendolyn I believe Velvet Cornelius Oswald and Mercedes who are all reigning from different kingdoms and they're all from different lines of royalty so kind of different social classes and it's just really good storytelling blended in throughout while you're battling in a side-scrolling RPG style. It's just really one game to get lost in. Another kind of like uh, 13 Sentinels, just like mostly for its good storytelling. Kind of sounds a bit like a combination between 13 Sentinels and Dragon's Crown. Hmm. I could definitely see that for sure. Yeah. The combat of uh, Dragon's Crown mixed with the storytelling of 13 Sentinels. I remember when, when this came out, uh, I don't remember a lot of 
you know, what, what was going on around it. I just remember one of my friends had gotten it and like the box art looked really cool. And I was like, Oh, Odin sphere. Is this like some kind of Nordic thing? And they were, they were like, no. And that was basically where that ended. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I never really looked more into it just, just cause I, I didn't know enough about it and I never ended up catching like, like watching them play it or anything like that. So, uh, mm -hmm. the box art looked really cool. Uh, and that's unfortunately the, the beginning and end of my experience with this. Kind of the yeah. same tale for me. I, I found it, saw the box art, thought it was cool, played it through it immensely, and then thought I should make a review of this, and that's how my channel started. <laughs> that's nice. really cool. Very cool. Yeah. This game, it's got some really gorgeous art in it, much like all the other Vanillaware games. As we said earlier in this episode, the company kind of prides itself on having extremely highly detailed hand-drawn graphics for most of their games. You know, it, it's almost like a, a precursor to flash animation in a, in a way, mm. in, in the sense that the way it was created, but it also is, in its own way is like an evolution of it and uh, kind of taking inspiration from like old school storybook kind of vibes like you know the way that things move that uh latest ghost and goblins game that just came out ghost and Go mm. or it's either ghost and goblins or ghouls ghost and, ghosts and ghosts or whatever it's called resurrection mm -hmm. that uh that kind of reminds me of of this type of art when as soon as i saw it i was like oh they're going for the vanilla wear style like <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So uh, tell me about some composers on Odin Sphere, Justin. So Masaharu Iwata, we have not yet talked about. And they started out back in 1987 doing sound porting and sound effects on Fantasy Zone. Got around to doing music composition in 1990 on World Champ. They were uncredited for that, but eventually they did a whole bunch of other stuff. So they are uncredited for the Game Over song in Double Dragon 2 The Revenge in 1991. There's so many uncredited. Uh, They're also uncredited for Baseball Stars 2 in 1992. Finally, they got credited well before this, but I'm going to go with Tactics Ogre in 1995 and and from there, like Ogre Battle 64, Person of Lord of the Caliber 1999, they were a music composer on, uh, and they just been at it since then. Up more recently, we have music composition on Grand Kingdom in 2016, uh, uh, as well as 2017's Final Fantasy XII, The Zodiac Age, they did additional composition. Nice. All right, I'm gonna take this opportunity to move on into uh, my next pick here for this Vanillaware-focused episode. Uh, this is gonna be from Muramasa the Demon Blade, which came out in the Wii in 2009 and the Vita as well, apparently, in 2013. The track is called Poor Meal, and it was by Hitoshi Sakamoto, Masaharu Iwata, Mitsuhiro Kaneda, Kimihiro Abe, Noriyuki Kamikura, Azusa Chiba, and Yoshimi Kudo. We all know you love the flavorful, anime-infused, clean look of Vanillaware games, but now we're branching out into unknown territory, cookies. Yes, that's right, we're partnering with food conglomerate Babisco in an attempt to blow the lid off this shishka cookie galaxy. 
First, we start off with a fan favorite, Vanillaware. This is exactly the kind of cookie you desire. Smooth vanilla outside, creamy vanilla inside. This baby will have your teeth chattering for more, with its rock-solid frame rate and exciting inventory system. Oh, whoops, wait a second, I think I got my wires crossed. Okay, let's try something new then. Introducing Chocoware. Yes, that same great 2.5D taste with 3D chocolate flavor. It'll make your mouth feel like you've been in the Bermuda Triangle, swimming for an eternity, with the only way out through the chocolatey bliss of Chocoware. Whoops, I don't even know how I got dimensions involved in all this. But wait, what's that? Looking for more variety? How about Strawberryware? The cookie that'll have you leaping into a pink crunchy cloud full of pillowy fruit goodness. A flavor so bold, it'll have you slapping the hood of your cookie and saying, the diversity of Bass Escape's composers really tastes like a mouthful of yumness. Hold on, something's not right. Let's keep going. Mint Chocoware. The only game developer based cookie to come with a mint under your pillow, or perhaps caramelware, the chewy pulp battle between good and evil, featuring some of the most disproportionate amounts of cookie to caramel. Vanillaware, coming ahead. soon to a cookie shelf near you from Babisco. Welcome back. That was Poor Meal from Muramasa the Demon Blade, the 2009 Wii release, also came out on the Vita in 2013, composed by everybody that we know and love, Hitoshi Sakamoto, Masahara Iwata, Mitsuhiro Kaneda, Kimihiro Abe, Noriyuki Kamikura, Azusa Chiba, and Yoshimi Kudo. I tend to notice a pattern with Vanillaware games where I see the art, I see the gameplay, and I'm like, yo, this is gonna be great, I gotta get this game. <laughs> I buy the game, and then I start it, and then I never finish it. And Miramasa is definitely in that Aww. caliber. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, I need to change that. Yeah, yeah. It looks so cool. We, we were actually, during the break, uh, Joey and I were, were talking about this, uh, and he was saying that he, he, he wants to get back to this, and I was like, I need to find it, hoping it's not like jacked up in price somewhere, because it looks, beautiful like the art style of the game like fits with vanilla wear style but they evoke this traditional japanese art style throughout the entire mm -hmm. game and it's just so cool and i mean you kind of hear that right here in the music too because this is it feels very much like a traditional japanese influence mm. and i mean you've got the flute that wood block and uh, dare i say i think i hear a shamisen maybe i definitely heard the flute and the pan flute that was very prominent for me great use of instrumentation in this track and just a really calm soothing track <laughs> what do you think about this one joey oh yeah definitely kept with that japanese theming i would say definitely more towards that area not too familiar with this one i actually have this one on my shelf and i definitely want to play it hearing this music definitely invokes that it just goes to show how well they can just adapt to any type of theming yeah, yeah absolutely it is beautiful and amazing. Like I said, I didn't didn't really even know about this one. I I've heard the name, but I feel like there are other games out there that use either like Miramasa or other versions of that word. Uh, it's usually the name of a sword, um, mm. but the game itself looks really neat. Uh, I mean, you play as two different characters. There's uh, Monohime, and they have their own story, and Kisuke has their own story. I am guessing that these stories eventually intertwine. Otherwise, it'd be, an, it'd be a really interesting game if you play two just like totally separate stories. <laughs> yeah, true, true. But the game itself is set in Japan on the island of Honshu during the Edo period. So it, it's like a, an action RPG. It's side scrolling, which is, is really interesting too. I don't see a, I don't see many of those anymore, like side scrolling action RPGs, but. There are two different categories of weapons that your characters can use. There's the blade, the katana, and then the long blade, the nodachi. And uh, there, there's you know ups and downs to both. Uh, the regular just katanas are fast, while the nodachi are slower, but they deal more damage. So, kind of you know what's your play style here? You can have three blades equipped at any one time. Each blade does have its own stats, so like every every sword has its own strengths and weaknesses, uh, as it were. 
So you can uh, you can also block with the blades as it is an action RPG. So real time stuff. Uh, and there are secret arts they're called. Uh, so special moves for the different blades. They also have a soul power gauge, which uh, if that is emptied, the sword breaks and uh, it is not useless, but uh, near enough. Like there, you're you're drastically reduced to what you can do with the blade. So to to fix that, you can sheathe your sword and the soul power will regenerate, which is really neat. Total of 108 blades that can be collected or created in game. That's a lot of blades. Yeah, that is a lot of blades. <laughs> <laughs> 108 characters in Suikoden, 108 blades in Muramasa. Coincidence? I think not. I mean, it probably yeah. is, but... <laughs> uh, probably. <laughs> well, that sounds cool. I remember starting this one, but never really got far in it. Mostly just bought it when it came out, kind of threw it on my shelf, and was like, I'll eventually get to it, and just never did. So <laughs> I, I really need to sit down with this one and, and play it on the Wii. It's cool that Nintendo got a exclusive title from Vanillaware because Vanillaware has mostly been like Sony, Sega, like with the Sega Saturn, Sega Dreamcast, you know, that sort of stuff mm. as far as what they worked on. And uh, yeah, they, they don't tend to release too many things on uh, Nintendo systems, but I don't know, maybe we'll see that change in the uh, future since the uh, Switch is so wildly popular these days. <laughs> maybe, maybe two of these composers we're not going to see again so we will talk real quick about Azusa Chiba who started out with Bass Escape back in 2008 on Let's Tap and then the follow up to that was this game Uramasa and they went on to do a whole lot of nifty things Tactics Ogre, Let Us Cling Together in 2011 they were a music arranger Devil's Third in 2015 they're listed under Bass Escape for that and their most recent credit here is in 2020 Grand Blue Fantasy Versus uh, they did music on that game and then we have Yoshimi Kudo who started out doing composition in 2008 with Tori no Hoshi Aerial Planet and went on to do things like Tekken 6 in 2009, Valkyria Chronicles 2 in 2010 as a proofreader back to doing music in Tactics Ogre in 2011 and most recently Dragon's Crown Pro in 2018 and 13 Sentinels in 2019 all right, let's get into my next pick. This is from a game that only came out in Japan, and it is called Grand Knight's History. This came out in the PSP in 2011. The track we're going to be listening to is called Tension, and Masaharu Iwata is the specific composer on this track, but the rest of the soundtrack is also done by Mitsuhiro Kaneda, Yoshimi Kudo, and Noriyuki Kamakura.
Welcome back. That was Grand Knight's History, and the track was called Tension, the PlayStation Portable Japanese exclusive that came out in 2011. That track was specifically done by Masaharu Iwata, but the rest of the soundtrack was done by Mitsuhiro Kaneda, Yoshimi Kudo, and Noriyuki Kamakura. Anybody think that this song had an almost like mix between a boss battle track and like a we're headed to the boss battle song kind of vibe hmm. oh, i can definitely see that yeah yeah i can see it it had like a very riding melody and it felt like not exploratory but it felt like you were on a journey for sure part of that is is mostly due to the fact that the game is a rpg it's primarily designed to be like a jrpg but it's online competitive Ooh. multiplayer so i don't know specifically if it's an mmorpg but they use the term online competitive multiplayer so it, i kind of get that vibe but you are taking on the role of a leader of a mercenary knight squad and uh you're in one of three kingdoms that you have to protect. So depending on which role you take on and what kingdom you're saving, you're representing each kingdom of a continent called Ristia. There's different character classes. There's three different kinds, knight, archer, or wizard. And the concepts and the ideas for this game were later used in Grand Kingdom which came out, I think, on the PS4, drew a lot of inspiration from this game as well as other types of Vanillaware games. The reason for that is because one of the people that worked on the game, the director Tomohiko Deguchi, ended up leaving Vanillaware and went on to develop Grand Kingdom utilizing these concepts. So, oh. kind of neat. Yeah, that is pretty It's funny cool. that you say that. Because, yeah. I mean, I've, I have Grand Kingdom, and I've been playing it, and I was like, this so much feels like a Vanillaware game, but I just don't see, you know, their <laughs> stamp on it anywhere. Boom. That's why. It just rocked your world. Yeah. <laughs> I learned something today. Yes. This track was, was really neat. Like, I, I really enjoyed the, the drums. The, the timpani were very prominent throughout this, but, like, I really feel that they made this track what it was. And I get some feels reminiscent of, like, almost Final Fantasy Tactics off of it. It feels just like one of those, like you were saying, it feels like it could be in the boss fight, but also, like, on the way to the boss fight. And there's a lot of that mm. that I kind of get out of Tactics for, uh, for the little bit that I played. But I do enjoy that, that soundtrack as well, so... For sure. Yeah, the PlayStation Portable had a lot of really unique and interesting games on it. It's a shame that this didn't get ported to North America. I guess there was a planned localization from Xseed Games and Rising Star Games, but uh, it ended up getting canceled, mostly because Vanillaware was uh, focusing on uh, Dragon's Crown. So, mm, it's unfortunate, but it makes Tension sense. Tension sounds like a good name for it. So Noriyuki Kamikura, I believe, is the only composer that we have here that we didn't talk about yet. So Noriyuki started off with Digimon World Data Squad in 2006. We talked about a couple of the games that they were working on, stuff like Upuna mm -hmm. in 2007. We mentioned that one earlier. Death Smiles in 2007, Trauma Center Under the Knife 2. On Tamarama is listed. It's a rhythm game that came out for the DS, and it's got a really good soundtrack, so definitely check that one out. Also did arrangements for East Memory of Celceta or Calcetta. Also did uh, the opening theme, All the World's a Stage for Project X Zone 2. Really great song, really great game. Their final arrangement is in Saga Scarlet Grace in 2018. And the rest of these guys we already talked about, or we will talk about. Yep. So let's move into Joey's last pick. What are we ending your round robin session with? This track will be from Grim Grimoire, and it's called A Book of Days. Yep, and it's by Hitoshi Sakamoto, Masaharu Iwata, Mitsuhiro Kaneda, Kimihiro Abe, and Noriyuki Kamakura. This is off the PlayStation 2 game in 2007.
Welcome back. That was Grim Grimoire's Book of Days, which came out on the PS2 in 2007, composed by Hitoshi Sakamoto, Masuharu Iwata, Mitsuhiro Kaneda, Kimihiro Abe, and Noriyuki Kamikura. This one was really neat. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out the words I want to use here. So, Joey, what did you think about this one? Why did you pick this one? Oh, man, I really love this one because it's just got this really weird blend of almost like industrial percussion mixed with like whimsical instruments mm. and uh just to, since we've kind of been doing this with every song i would like to know where you guys think this takes place in the game if you had to guess <laughs> Ooh, that's a good question i'm gonna say in the very beginning when you are just like seeing the beginning like cutscenes and you're getting introduced to a, a very whimsical character who may be like telling the tale from a storybook or something like that that's kind of the vibe that i got from this i also got a very danny elfman vibe from mm. this track though but uh, <laughs> maybe that's just because of the string arrangement mm. yeah i would say i got the feeling that this was more a location like either the inside of like a castle or someone's rather large home. Like it doesn't feel like, like a one room house. Like it feels like either a, a castle ish thing or not quite a dungeon. I probably got to give this one closer to Mike because yeah. it is not necessarily the uh, opening. And I'd actually would say, I'd almost think it would be what you were describing but it's actually the chapter selection theme where you're choosing which mm. book you want to choose for which day. Okay. It's kind of like a clever way to work in that title. Yeah, book of days. I don't uh -huh. think it plays anywhere else. Huh. The title of this game, Grim Grimore, it's interesting because the letters are like uppercase, lowercase, uppercase, lowercase, uppercase, lowercase. Like, <laughs> uh, does that fall into the, the story or the characters or anything? I think there is a, a grimoire that they are hunting for, but, you know, I don't think so. And I do hmm. think the way it's written out gives it two ways to pronounce the game. I've heard of it, but I've always just called it Grim Grimoire. Yeah. Yeah. I'm noticing that the only letters that are capital are the R's and the M's. Everything else, like the G's, the I's, like it looks like it's every other, but it's really not like when you get to, when you get to the end there. So... I wonder if the if R and M are significant. Uh, tell us a little bit about this game, Joey. So you kind of start out as, I don't remember her name, but a budding pupil magician going into a school that has different types of factions and spell casting. And you're kind of learning each little bit from each and every teacher. But as that's going on, you kind of learn about underlying plots of people trying to sabotage other people and something happens where the ender of all time comes and everything is kind of destroyed except you kind of wind up back three days ago whenever you're first starting so you have to keep finding out what's going on and figuring out like who's causing it and who to trust and who not to trust wow so kind of like a um majora's mask kind of thing yeah i always like to call it like magician girl groundhog day yeah yeah <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> and and gameplay wise, it's it's like a 2D side scrolling, you know, much like most of their games. Is yeah, it the, like a action RPG sort of thing or more like a beat em up? This one's actually more of a tower defense. Mm, you kind okay. of have a main crystal and you can summon four. I'm not sure if it's just four, but different factions of demons and spectral entities that have advantages and disadvantages over each other faction. And you basically have to destroy their power crystal before they can destroy yours. It's very huh. manic, but also very fun. Hmm. Sounds a bit like uh, 13 Sentinels in a way, because that also had like tower defense atmosphere. Pretty much. Yeah. Amazing how all their stuff just kind of <laughs> blends together. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But at the Very same cool. time, it's also a different experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's one thing I really like about their games is that even though the settings and the characters and everything will change and stay unique, the gameplay always remains fresh and different in each game. Even if they repeat game styles, they still make it unique enough so that the games have their own identity. Yeah, yeah. 
All right, Justin, let's get into your final pick. What do you got for us? All right, so I'm going to revisit Odin Sphere. As we said, came out on the PS2 in 2007. The PS3 was re-released in 2011. This is Victory by the Base Escape crew, Hitoshi Sakamoto, Masaharu Iwata, Kimihiro Abe, Mitsuhiro Kaneda, and Manabu Namiki. Welcome back, dear XVGM listeners. That was my last pick of the episode. You got one more coming up after this, but that was Victory from Odin Sphere. Came out in 2007 on the PS2 and was re-released in 2011 on the PS3. And it was by our favorite little group of friends this evening, the Base Escape crew, Hitoshi Sakamoto, Masaharu Iwata, Kimihiro Abe, Mitsuhiro Kaneda, and Manabu Namiki. I finally get to tell my Odin Sphere story. Uh, much like you guys, when the game came out, I was like, cool, this game looks awesome. I love the cover art. The visuals are unbelievable. I'm going to pick this up. And I remember sitting with my buddy JR in my old apartment, and we're sitting down playing the game. He's starting to notice as I'm picking things up, because it's an action RPG kind of game where you're going through, you're, you're beating the bad guys, and then you know they drop stuff, and you can pick it up. Well, very quickly, my inventory filled up. And here's the thing. I'm the type of person where I pick up everything. <laughs> like, even if it's like health that I have full health, I pick it up. I don't care. So I ended up maxing out very, very early in the game. Like within the first hour, I maxed out my inventory. <laughs> and so then I started manipulating my inventory. Like, okay, I don't need this. I need that. Oh, I got too many of these. Let me drop these. And it got to the point where I was spending more time in the inventory messing around than I was playing the game. So my friend JR is like, this is not an action RPG. This is inventory management, the game. <laughs> and it was yeah. that moment right then and there that I was like, wow, yeah, this I'm not digging this. This is not cool. So I ended up selling the game years later. I found out about this re-release and ended up getting the collector's edition from somebody like secondhand for a really, really good price. I think I paid like 50 bucks for it or something like mm -hmm. that. They apparently changed the game's inventory system where you don't max out your inventory like in two seconds. Oh, so nice. that's kind of good. It was absolutely a quality of life like thing. And I don't know if you remember this too. It's going on what you were talking about. Basically, you can fuse things together, which is a huge mechanic of the game. Mm. But every time you fuse something with something else, you drop the item. Yes. So it was this like repetitive motion of going into your menu, fusing something together, dropping your item, picking it up, and just repeating. <laughs> Luckily, they like did away with all of that. Uh, yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm, I'm glad that they made the changes that they did because it makes the game just so much more playable. Again, this is one of those situations where... I picked up the game on a whim just because I liked the visuals and everything and then didn't really actually like the game while playing it because of those reasons. So the fact that they went back and they recognized their their what you know that that they made the game very unfriendly for at least people that play like me. So I'm looking forward to diving into this newer game. I mean, this track I believe takes place after you beat a boss or go on to another chapter is is that right joey did i have that right it's actually it plays every time you win a battle throughout the maps so yes. you, it's, a, it's a track you hear probably more than any other track 
Yeah, mm-hmm. this was definitely a song where when I heard it again in you know when we just heard it, I was like, oh, why does this sound so familiar? And I'm like, oh yeah, because I actually played this game. So I can't say that about too many of the games that I, I picked from. Uh, in fact, two of the games that I picked from were Japanese exclusives. But this one uh, that uh, I didn't pick, Justin picked this one. But as soon as I, I heard it, I was like, yeah, I remember this track. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so Manabu Namiki started off doing sound creation in Thunder Dragon 2 in 1993, uh, went on to do music in Blandia in 1994, uh, Armed Police Bat Rider in 1998. That sounds awesome. Still around doing stuff. Moved on to uh, music composition Metal Slug 6 in 2006. Uh, and then uh, as of recent, their last music composition credit is in 2016 for Caladrius Blaze. Yeah, just to touch on them real quick, the standouts for me at least personally are the Rebirth games. So mm. Ca- Castlevania Adventure Rebirth, Contra Rebirth, and Gradius, Gradius Rebirth, Rebirth all yeah. done in 2009. Fair, fair, absolutely. Amazing stuff. Yeah. All right, why don't you close this out? Yes. My next game and my last game is Fantasy Earth Zero. This came out on the PC in 2006, and that was the Japanese release. The U.S. release was in 2010. And this track is called Track 18. It's by Hitoshi Sakimoto, Masaharu Iwata, Manabu Namiki, and Kenichi Koyano.
Welcome back to our ex-VGM Radio Spotlight on Vanillaware Games with our guest of honor, Pragmatic, a.k.a. Joey. The track that we just heard was from a game called Fantasy Earth Zero. This is a game that was released on the PC in 2006 in Japan and in 2010 in the U.S. And the track, which is simply called Track 18, is composed by Hitoshi Sakimoto, Masaharu Iwata, Manabu Namiki and Kenichi Koyano. This track was very relaxing. I wanted to <laughs> pick something that would end the show with kind of a soft, like lullaby esque atmosphere. I get a very watery vibe to this one, a mm -hmm. very like wintry, watery kind of feeling. And this would be perfect if like you were at a spa, hang out and listen to it. Yeah, I gotta say, I almost want to say don't listen to this at uh, the end of this episode while driving because I don't want to be responsible for anybody falling asleep at the wheel. Uh, <laughs> like you said, it's so relaxing. Uh, that That's literally all I wrote down because I almost fell asleep listening to this. And not because it's a bad song or a boring song, but it was so relaxing that I'm just like, let me close my eyes and listen to this. And the next thing I know, it's 2 a.m. or something. Yeah. So just to clarify, there's a little bit of confusion regarding who actually developed this game and i'll explain the mm. confusion so originally the game came out under the name fantasy earth the ring of dominion and that was developed by vanillaware and a company called multi-term so it was released then in 2006 by square enix they did it as like a play online service game mmo rpg mm -hmm. it was later on released under GameSpot as a free-to-play title the company that developed it for that with the re-release was Soft Gear. Again, published by Square Enix and GameSpot. So hmm. kind of interesting. So it started off as a project that began in 2001 under Enix. George Kamatani was kind of heading the project. Initially, I guess it was going to be like a, a humans versus vampires sort of thing. But then they shifted gears to make it more of like the fantasy aspect that this game invokes hmm. more like sword and sorcery traditional type uh, MMORPG but you get to pick an avatar and you can choose one of five different nations that you can fight for there's no storyline but there is a bit of a narrative that's created by the players different factions so the game's setting takes place in a world of Melferia which is it was a very peaceful place. There were some differences between the different factions, which erupted into full-on wars. And uh, they were trying to control these magic crystals that gave birth. So that's basically the story. Uh, you can choose your gender, choose your character class, weapon type, and go from there. It does have player versus player battles. And uh, it's all carried out on the same server. I don't believe that this game is still running anymore as far as being able to play it <laughs> oh, online. I'd be surprised. <laughs> yeah, but hmm. I dug the track and I thought it was cool and I wanted to spotlight the game just because, you know, it is technically a Vanillaware game. Yeah, no, that was really cool. And I mean, that's that's the, the base escape crew. And again, not that they're tied to Vanillaware or anything, but they did do a lot of Vanillaware music. So sure, this is not my kind of game at all. I'm not a big <laughs> MMORPG fan at all. But, you know, most of the other games that Vanillaware has come out with are more my cup of tea rather than this one. Yeah, yeah. I would say that this track was really unique from the rest of, like, what you usually hear. Mm. And uh, it kind of pulled me towards, like, Final Fantasy IV, specifically the theme of love. And, uh, oh, okay. Yeah, I was just like, that sounds so much like it, but it also <laughs> sounds, like, so much not like Vanillaware, and I kind of like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, I wonder how much of Square Enix kind of rubbed off on them regarding the uh, the music and the sound creation. I guess we'll never know. But uh, <laughs> the only other composer that we have to talk about for this game is Kenichi Koyano. Kenichi started off in 1994 with Shin Nihon Pro Wrestling 94 Battlefield in Tokyo Dome. Then later on followed it up with Super Bomberman Panic Bomber W in 1995. They also did composition for the Bloody Roar series through Konami. Mm. So Bloody Roar 1997, 1998, the sequel. Then they kind of jumped around. They also did Armed Police Batrider in 1998. <laughs> and their final game, they jumped over and did a couple Pokemon games. 
starting with Poke Park Wii Pikachu's Adventure in 2009, Pokemon Ranger Guardian Signs in 2010, and Poke Park 2 Wonders Beyond in 2011. That's our final game credit. So that's going to close out our episode for Vanillaware Games. Pretty interesting selection of games and composers, of course, with Bass Escape. And uh, Joey really brought some interesting and unique tracks, as well as tons of information about some of these games that we, Justin and I, both don't really have that much experience <laughs> with. So it was cool to sit down and talk about these guys. Oh, yeah, it's very fun indeed. Mm hmm. So now is the time when we pick our favorite tracks of the episode. We uh, are going to start off with our guest of honor, Joey. So what is your favorite pick of this one? I do love the ones that I've chosen, but I really have to give it to that Fantasy Earth Zero track 18. Just the way it kind of uh, went against my expectations and exceeded them is just amazing. <laughs> I might have to check that one out and see if there's any other bangers out there. Yeah, Very yeah. Cool. that was kind of like the sleeper hit, the surprise of the uh, of the episode. Interesting. It was definitely more of a, I don't want to say a throwaway track, but it was one of those <laughs> tracks that I picked that I was like, I like this track. I'm going to pick it, but it's, it wasn't my favorite at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's basically the same reason of why um, I picked Victory for the, uh, from Odin Sphere to be on the, uh, the episode. But I think if I were going to pick my favorite track... I think I would go with your Dragon's Crown Pro. Uh, a decision has to be made. I uh, I really enjoyed the energy that that one brought. Yeah, for sure. That's such a great track. I got to say, of all the tracks that I heard, I was most impressed with the 13 Sentinels Aegis. I don't know. That Isoleucine track was really cool, and uh, it, it stood out for me the most, mostly because... All the other tracks that we picked here are very fantasy based, very mm -hmm. like more fantastical and the orchestral mix with orchestral instruments, naturally sounding and world sounding instruments, which are all great. Like, don't get me wrong. I loved all the music in this episode, but definitely that 13 Sentinels track. Mm -hmm. When that played, I was like, whoa, it really stood out to me with that mix of electronic music and uh, a really crunchy, heavy bass. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, that's going to be my pick. Good pick, good pick. But, Definitely a fan track yeah. you could listen to. Yeah, yeah, I got a feeling I'm going to have to pick this one up. So now we want to hear what your favorite picks were from this episode. Make sure to go to our social media and let us know what you liked, what you didn't like, what you thought of our guest. Please be nice. He's, <laughs> he's a very special boy to us. Please be nice. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so Joey, it's been a blast having you on. We are big fans of your stuff, and uh, we want to know what you're working on, if you can tell us what you're working on right now or what's coming out in the future. Well, I believe I just recently released a collab with you over Nightshade, which was the sequel to Shinobi. Yes. And currently I am trying to work on the Dynasty Warriors Gundam series, Game Ooh. 1, 2, and 3. Nice. Just covering it as a whole and just talking about its over-the-top silliness. <laughs> and eventually, I hope to have Tales of Fate, which was a PS1 Squaresoft game hmm. at the works. Very cool. At that moment, I believe that is all I have. Awesome. Uh, I am looking forward to your Dynasty Warriors Gundam bit because I've really only ever played the third one heavily, but I had so much fun with it. And I, I've played one and two a little bit here and there, but three was so much fun. <laughs> and you really might like that one because it's definitely covering all three and just giving the strong points and the weak points and just <laughs> how much I love Gundam and kind of love Dynasty Warriors. Looking forward to that. And uh, thank you again for coming on the show and talking about all the all this vanillaware uh, stuff with us oh absolutely thank you for having me on i <laughs> love touching up on this stuff so we'd like to take a moment to thank our patreon patrons without whom this show's continued improvement would be impossible they are alex messenger cam warma chris hart dan lawton jordan and anson davis kung fu carlito of the heroes 3 podcast scott McElhone, chris myers peter panda the Autistic Gamer 89, Brad Austin, Chris Murray, Jeremy Rutz, Llama Adam, Marcus Stewart, Nathan Cooper, Nick Davis, and Ryan McPherson. If you would like to become a patron, you can sign up at patreon.com slash XVGM radio. There you can see the different tiers as well. Just $1 gets you a thank you at the end of the show and access to our monthly live shows. 
You can visit our website, xvgmradio.com, where you can listen to all the episodes and learn more about your hosts, as well as any of our guests or composers that we've had on the show. If you'd like to reach out to us, you can always email us at xvgmradio at gmail.com. If you've liked what you've heard, please consider giving us a review on iTunes. You can join our Facebook group and chat with other VGM lovers at facebook.com slash groups slash XVGM radio, where we talk about everything from current game news to sharing awesome VGM tracks or just talking about the podcast itself. You can also find us on Twitter and Instagram. Our handle on both of those sites is at XVGM radio. If you don't have any other social media or just want to try something unique, check us out on our Discord group chat. Links will be in the show notes. All right, Justin, in two weeks, we're coming back with another new episode, episode 73, and we're going super popular. We're going from a more obscure company <laughs> to a more well-known company. What, what are we tackling on, on 73? So we are going to be tackling the hot topic of Zelda handhelds. Uh, this is going to be a, a bit of fun because I'm actually in the middle of playing the Link's Awakening remake um, on the on the Switch. So, uh, nice, me can, too. Nice, nice. So you can bet that's going to be in there. There's so, so many good Zelda handheld games. Uh, I can't wait to revisit them because I haven't really touched on a lot of these since like high school or college. Yes, there is a ton of handheld goodness for Zelda. The games are mostly really good and the music is equally as amazing. So mm. we're going to talk about that on episode 73 but until then this is mike and justin signing off for xvgm radio so manbu or yeah <laughs> manbu Manab- manabu manabu, namin. Yeah. manabu yes <laughs> jesus <laughs> <sighs> I wonder if the if R and M are significant in any way to the maybe game. Maybe you have to maybe you have to say them a little louder than the rest. So you're like Rims Jeez. Like with some of the voice hiding in there, I would not doubt that. Okay.